know, and then mm. you know, because there's, you, there's nowhere to go, there's no one's gonna be there. So why dress up? So she saved like ten thousand dollars. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, you know. Because <laughs> hey, Jomo, I think we got to figure it out. Can you hear us? I can, sir. Hot dog. Sorry to interrupt. Keep going with your story. All right. <clears throat> well, just how uh, the world shifted. Uh, I know uh, in semblance of time, do you want me to start running? Want me to pray and to start running with the message? Because I know. Yes. They're obviously enjoy enjoying fellowship together. Yes. Yeah, go, Jomo. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time's opportunity. Father God, we pray for your wisdom, your insight, and your direction. So, Lord, I thank you right now that you have your way. Lord, give us ears to hear and a heart to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, today, as I was, uh, I, as a couple weeks ago, Chris called me, and we were having a great discussion. And uh, this week and all the events that happened, you know, it just I, all made sense to me. And as all of us know, uh, we are in a very turbulent time in our country, the world. Uh, as, as, as my friend said before, we got plagues, we got all kinds of things happening. And uh, we are in the midst of a huge decision uh, for our country. And I said, you know what? Uh, a couple of people reached out to me with the same question. Uh, Chris and I spoke about leadership. And then another person said, you know, Jomo, what do you think about what's happening in our world? Another friend asked me, you know, you know, he said, I'm really struggling with what I got to do in reference to the election, all these other things. I'm really struggling. And obviously, as Christians, we have certain belief systems that I think are pretty much uh, biblical. And I said, you know, so it's like, how do you process your decision? So I said, uh, this is what I do. So what I'm going to talk about today is what I do when I'm trying to process a decision. Also, um, what kind of leader do I need to be? And what kind of leader do I need to look for? Okay, so uh, my main text today uh, is from Matthew, um, Matthew chapter, uh, I got so much scripture, but Matt, no, uh, Proverbs, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter six, Proverbs chapter six, um, I'm reading out the Amplified, and it speaks of what does God hate, okay, so if I'm going to make decisions on things, I say, okay, uh, I know what God does not like. And by knowing what God does not like, it gives me some inference of what God does like. Got it? So it reads, and then I'm going to break it down. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 reads, these six things the Lord hates, indeed seven. Seven are repulsive to him. A proud look, the attitude that makes one overestimate oneself and discount others a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that creates wicked plans, feet that run swiftly to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, even half-truths, and one who spreads discord, rumors among brothers. So when I break this down, both of them. You guys, you good? All right. So by implying this, let's start with this. God hates haunty eyes, okay? Therefore, God loves eyes that gaze on humility. Not a false or broken humility, but despising oneself, but a genuine Christ-like choice to serve others. Not to draw undue attention to oneself, but to treat others with honor and respect, okay? Then he says, God hates a lying tongue. So what does that mean? It means God loves truth. Uh, the Bible says in John 14, 6, but he is the way, he is the truth and he is the life. So therefore, God loves those who speak truth. Note that this does not say a brash tongue or a loud tongue, but a tongue which speaks its opinion at any and every possible moment. Rather, he loves a tongue which, when it speaks, it values honesty and artfulness, okay? God hates hands that shed blood. So what does that mean? Therefore, God loves hands that protect the innocent. Throughout scripture, God's compassion for the defenseless and the innocent is clear. 
He commands his children in Hebrew and in the New Covenant to protect the defenseless. That Psalms 82, 3 and 4. Welcome the alien, Matthew 25, 35. Care for the widow, James 1, 27. Defend the orphan, Deuteronomy 24, 17. And mourn with those who are mourning. We are to be peaceful, not bloodthirsty. Our hands should therefore strive to protect the innocents. All right. The next one, God hates the heart that devises wicked plans. Therefore, if he hates that, he loves the heart that devises good and righteous plans. God loves our desires to serve, our desires to help, our desires to minister. When our hearts long to carry out God's plan for goodness, righteousness, and peace, it delights him. All right. The next one, God hates feet that run rapidly to evil. Therefore, God loves feet that run rapidly to goodness. Our feet carry enormous power. Where we choose to walk and truly define the person we are. We will, be, we will choose to walk away from fruitless arguments or remain in attempt to stubbornly prove a point. We will choose to chase after those whom we have wronged, asking for forgiveness, or we will let our feet wander to where this, uh, let our feet wander to where spirit leads us, or we'll guide ourselves to selfish desires. God hates a false witness who utters lies. Therefore, God loves a trustworthy witness who speaks the truth. When we are beacons of integrity, truth, honor, God rejoices. In any situation, a witness is charged to faithfully report what happened to the best of their ability. The greatest witness we can be is faithful witnesses of God's work in our lives. We will stand boldly and speak the truth of God to the world. Are we living our lives as false witnesses or trustworthy witnesses? Next, God hates one who spreads strife between the brothers. Therefore, God loves the one who spreads peace. The Bible says in Matthew, blessed are the peacemakers, so they shall be called the children of God. It's, re it's really only possible to spread peace or strife. That's the option. I, 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 said, I, I, I broke it down like this. Are you a fire starter or you a peacemaker? There's only two options. Either you're trying to bring people together or you're trying to tear people apart. Those are the options God gives us. Every word we speak contributes to one of these two attributes of our relationship. And God loves those who value peace, proving a point being heard or manipulating situations with one word at a time, God wants us to change our attitude and sow seeds of peace. So I broke it down, okay? So this, this is what God loves. This is what God hates, okay? So when I'm processing things, I say, okay, what does God love and what does God hate? Then I go to the next level, okay? Uh, the Bible says, you shall know a person's heart. Now, how can I know the heart? God says, man judge from the outer appearance. Man judges from the outer appearance, but I judge from the heart. So then the question is, how do I know a person's heart? Well, God gives me two ways for me to know a person's heart. It's called M and M. I know some of you are thinking about M and M's, chocolate, uh, peanut, uh, almond. No, M and M. You will find out a person's heart. Two areas: their money and their mouth. Their money and their mouth. So if I want to make a decision about, huh, I wonder where that person's heart is. All you have to do is their money and their mouth. And it's the Bible. Got it? So where is that in the Bible, Jomo? I'm glad you asked me. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. It reads, for your treasure is, for where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. Your wishes, your desires, of which your, set, your life centers on will be also. So wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So if you ever saw my wife, okay, she has a nice ring. She has a diamond earrings. She has a, a diamond bracelet. I said, you know where my treasure is. It's on her. All my money is on her. Now, I don't know if I'm talking to anybody right now, but you know what I'm talking about. All my money is on her. Why? Because that's where my treasure is. 
when you look at your children, they have clothes and shoes and covered. Why? Because you take care of them because that's where your treasure is, because that's where your heart is. So I will know where a person's heart based on their where their money goes, where your money goes. When I looked at how much I spent on my children, my God, Jesus, tutors, uh, this class, that class, thousands of dollars a month on my kids because what? That's my treasure. When I look at the tuition I'm paying for a university right now, my son is up in his room sleeping and I'm paying rent in Tallahassee because only freshmen and seniors can be on campus. He's a junior, by the way. So guess what? I am paying tuition and I am paying rent in a townhouse he is not in. And I am frustrated about that, but that's all right. It's all good. But my point to you is, <laughs> that's, part of, that's my treasure. So guess what? You will find out where a person's heart is based on where their money goes. That's why he says where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Then I will find out where a person's heart is with their mouth. Your mouth? Absolutely. This is Luke 645. Luke 645. It reads this. An intrinsically good person produces what is good and honorable, moral, out of the good treasure stored in his heart. An intrinsically evil person produces what is wicked and depraved out of an evil heart. Here it is. For his mouth speaks the overflow of his heart. Your mouth is connected to your heart. Now, this is not my opinion. This is what the Bible says. So when a person says, screw you, bleep this, blap that, and they say, man, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say it. No, you said what you meant. I believe you. Don't worry. You don't have to apologize. I'd rather you just tell me how you really feel because the Bible clearly states that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So two ways. You can identify where a person is. And this is great for business. This is great for life. Two ways, their money and their mouth, M and M. So if you ever get in a pickle and you try to figure out where a person is, just look where they put their money and look what they talk about. The Bible says in Proverbs 4 and 23, your heart directs your life. Your heart directs your life. So. When a person tells you their words, all they're doing is they're telling you where their heart is. Amen. So the next thing I do, okay, when I'm thinking about leadership, by the way, I, 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 uh, I was a leadership trainer. So when Chris and I were talking, I said, Chris, this is, what I, this is my challenge with this leadership form because every book that I read from John Maxwell and all my studying, this is not good leadership. This is just not the way we can navigate through seasons. And I said, then I have to say, look, I always look at myself and say, okay, how can I navigate? How can I identify? How can I look at? So we're just having a great, a great debate. And that's where I got this idea for this conversation this morning is what do I look for? Then uh, Titus tells us this, Titus 1, 7 through 4. It talks about leadership, okay? It says this, uh, for a, for a steward should be blameless, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not violent, not greedy for dishonest gain, but financially ethical. He must be hospitable to believers as well as strangers, a lover of what is good, sensible, upright, fair, devout, self-disciplined, above reproach, whether in public or private. He must firmly hold to trustworthy word of God that's taught him. And so he will be both give good and accurate instruction. So I said, okay, now, these are the qualities I'm looking for, okay? Now the challenge is, who has all of these qualities? Very few, okay, very few. And we know that all authority is from God. Okay, so now as I am wrestling with what we're wrestling with, because the reality, some are wrestling, some are not wrestling, but the, the gist of it is decisions have to be made. So how can I, as a believer in Jesus Christ, 
go down the checklist of what God likes and what God hates. Uh, what is up in a person's heart and what are the things that I should try to identify in so that I can make good decisions and I also can be a good leader for my people. Because whether you are a CEO, employee, independent contractor, patriarch, grandfather, uncle, we're all leaders. And our, the way we walk, more is caught than taught. So your life is being lived out every day. So how I navigate and how I become the Christ-like figure, authority, in my sphere, that people can see the God in me. How can I lead more people to God? How can I lead more people by my walk, my talk, my actions? Because at the end of the day, God willing, we all get to heaven. And the first question God's going to ask us is, who did you bring with you? I'm glad you made it. The last thing I said was go and tell somebody about me. So our life is all about how many people can we make an indelible impact on their lives that they can see the God in me, that I can represent Christ to the world through my life, through my actions. So two aspects, being the leader God wants me to be and determining factors of choosing good leaders. Ah, any questions, y'all? Any questions? Okay. Well, remember, as we evaluate your choices in, in your comments, we in our heart have to believe what would God want. And when you take a look at actions, please, actions say so much more than words. I hear people talk about words and how important words are and how they do come from the heart. But actions go way beyond the heart. It's a sad commentary, but if we don't have love, we've got nothing. And, you know, I think it's up to each of us to show God's love in how we speak and what we do. We're not here to make everybody happy, but we're here to show everybody that we love them, no matter what their decisions, what their choices are. Just you an know, opinion. You said it, uh, Harry. Uh, for, that's First Corinthians chapter 13. In reference, he says, if you, you, can, you can do all the talk you want and all the other aspects, but if you have love, if you don't have love, you have nothing. That's right. Uh, and it, it speaks on uh, love is patient, love is kind, long is love suffering, love uh, keeps no record of wrong. And he says, but you could do all of this, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. And 1 John 4, 8, it says, for God is love. And those who know God know God's love. And if you do not love, you do not know God. For God is the essence of love. Anybody else, y'all? Jomo, what would you say to somebody that says the, the ends justify the means? <clears throat> well, biblically, if you just shot straight with that, um, I have to, and I, I go with this, as I stand before God, at the end of the day, we're all going to stand before God by ourselves. And as I, as I go through my choices of decisions and leadership and all the other aspects, because I had a, a friend, that asked, we had a heated conversation last week about it. And I, I said, um, if I focus on, I want the end goal in reference to that. And I said, now, how would God navigate this? For example, okay, I got, my brother was like, Jomo, what about uh, uh, life and death? I said, throughout the Bible, example in Noah, Genesis chapter six, God started all over again, basically killed everyone on earth, right? And 
And she said, so what about that? I said, exactly. I said, so God has some prerogative in regards to certain aspects. So I really have to pray and get wisdom from God on how I need to respond and act. So what I cannot do is I cannot... Lost you. You're locked up on us, Jomo. We can't hear you. You're you're st stuck in one frame. We lost him. There he is. You're muted, Jomo. <clears throat> Back. I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, had a little power surge and everything went bye-bye. Um, I really have to ask God in reference because there's often tough decisions we have to make, and I have to make sure God has given me wisdom. So what I've done for me, especially when I don't understand the ends, I try to identify with what God loves and what God doesn't love. And then also I say, okay, what characteristics can I take from this individual that is closest to God? None will be perfect, understood that. But what characteristics, and that's why I went with um, God hates, God loves. I said, because that's going to get me closer. Because if I know already what God loves and what God hates, I will align myself more with what God loves versus what God hates. If that makes sense. Because obviously Isaiah 55, 8 says his ways are higher than my ways, his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. So I'm never going to think on the level that God thinks on. But my goal is to think in alignment with the things that he liked in the Bible and the things he hated in the Bible. Got it? It's muddy, to say the best. Cl clear as mud. That's right. But we, you know, that's the fight and struggle we're in, trying to discern what is the best way to go. Jomo? Yes, sir. I'm reading a book by Eric Metaxas now, which is called If You Can Keep It. It refers to uh, the statement made right after the Constitution was finalized when uh, Dr. Benjamin Franklin was leaving what's now called Independence Hall. And a friend of his, a lady, asked him, Dr. Franklin, what kind of a government do you have? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. Huh. Uh, my taxes, as you probably know, is a, is a Christian author. And his main, main point in this book is that the government that the founders set up was suitable for the population at the time, which basically was committed to, um, although there were lots of different religions, it, basically the whole population of the the people who had come from Europe to start taking over 
what's now the United States, that they all were committed to the same moral standards to the Judeo-Christian ethic, if you say, if you uh, think about it. And the point of his book is that um, the founders said from the beginning that the type of government that we have is only suitable for people who have that moral commitment, that heart, that heart commitment. Um, and uh, when we, with all the things that are going on in our country today, um, and I just wonder uh, how we as Christians uh, can, can be helpful in the process of trying to get the country back on track from this uh, great division and animus that we have in our culture. Agreed. I think that, um, first off, I don't know if people are truly committed to what it means to be a believer. I think that uh, our priorities have changed. Um, as Matthew 6.33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's not really what people are seeking. So if you don't have a motive to, to be what Christ has called us to be, if that's not your end goal, then obviously we're not going to get there or at least have some semblance of it. Now, again, nobody's Christ. Um, and it's, it's not one person. It's a whole, it's a whole thought process. So this is not, I'm not castigating any ind individual, but I think that, uh, I think that things have taken us off course to what God's called us to be and, and to max, to be, to be the Christ in every situation, which obviously I know it's in, in the world that we're dealing with all kinds of things are coming off, but it had, it, it, there's, there, there should be at least a moral compass of even the Bible says, even if they don't know God, they still know right from wrong. Uh, even, even that aspect um, that we should try to, you know, to get to that place. But I don't think uh, the Bible says that in the, in the end days, people will crave for things that are not of God. Uh, and, and that's that. What, what, what do people want? Where's the hunger <clears throat> for God in this, in this <clears throat> season? So it's, it's a, it's a challenging time, but we know that um, as all these disasters are happening in reference to the fires, floods, all these things, we're coming to the end. What, what exact date? I don't know, but we, it's obviously coming to the end. So we really have to be about souls. And obviously you're not going to change everybody, but as many people as we can enlighten to, to God's way is what we should do. Anyone else? Thank you, John Muller. Richard Sample. I'm uh, relatively new uh, here, um, and I enjoyed uh, your talking about money and your mouth. And I'd just like to say, before I became a, a what I would uh, hopefully others believe that I'm a practicing Christian today, uh, I had a pretty good mouth on me, and uh, I knew the, and used to utilize the expletives with the best of them. And training your mouth is something that can be done, and it is in a stark contrast if once you get over that, uh, because it's a habit that is uh, can be changed and actively changed and what was amazing in my case was that the the guys that i hung out with to go fishing and to go here or there and young noticed it immediately that i basically had quit cussing entirely and that was in stark realization to what i used to be correct and it'll change your mind at the same time because every time that you catch yourself <coughs> Think of God. Would God want me to say this? So that, in fact, will change your behavior and probably direct you to spend your money 
for good causes. You know, right. It's like nature. So I appreciate the, the, the sermon today on money in your mouth. And I think that's uh, uh, a very practical way for people to begin to have their, to change their behavior and to have others around you notice it. So thank you. Amen. You know, a couple of scriptures that go along with it. <clears throat> Proverbs 18.21. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who indulge in it will eat the fruit thereof, meaning we will eventually eat our words. Okay? So that's Proverbs 18.21. Then you have uh, Job 22 and 28. It says, You shall decide and decree a thing, and it will be established for you. So our words, once we make decisions, have power. Then 2 Corinthians 4.13, it says, we have the same spirit of faith as those who believed and spoke. Therefore, we also believe and we also speak. You will, be, you will speak what you believe. Then uh, Psalms 45 and 1, it says, my tongue is like the pen of a ready writer, meaning our words actually write the future it's amazing so if you took that and you connect that with genesis chapter one where god said let there be light let there be firmament and let us make man god created us to be word carriers so our words have power so we are in such a dangerous time because if if we have people speaking destructive words the Bible says, as the head, so goes the body. <laughs> so you may feel good about something, but if the head of a thing has, has a, a lead or a bend, we're going to go with the head because that's how the body's made. So it's critical that we have a, a voice of life. The Bible says you speak death or life, and that's Proverbs 8 and 21. Notice it says death first, then life. We have a propensity as humans to be speak negatively because negative words have a greater response. The news, if the news is all good, people don't watch. People want to see a car crash. They want to see negativity. So we have to inject life in this situation. John 10.10 10 says, I came to give you life and give you life more abundantly because there's a trickle-down effect in reference to the words we use. Words change the atmosphere. So how you speak, a husband comes home and said, look, you know, how a husband comes home and speaks to in his house changes the whole atmosphere. If you've ever had a mad wife, my God, if you've been around a mad woman and she's mad at you, it changes the atmosphere. So guess what? Whether we like it or not, when we speak these words out, it changes the atmosphere. So it doesn't just affect us, it affects our kids, it affects our schools, and all this animosity is an atmosphere. And if, if words could change, it changes everything. Because again, that's how we are created. We are word carriers. It's funny, my, my pastor told me, he says, um, basically they wrote a, a negative article about him and he called the newspaper up and said, he said, hey, man, um, that article is not true. And the owner of the, the, owner of the uh, newspaper said, I know, but it's my newspaper. When you get your own newspaper, you can write what you want to write. And he said, what? He said, but it's not true. He said, I don't care. He says, when you get a paper, you can write whatever you want to write. And he says, that's the challenge that everyone has a newspaper because we have social media and you can write whatever you want to write, whether it's true or false, this is good, bad. So that's the world we're in, that your words have power, good or bad. And, you know, it's critical that we speak life. Pastor Jomo, good morning. This is Jimmy Wood. Can you hear me? Hey, sir. Yeah, uh, the one scripture that comes to mind to me, um, because sometimes it's, it's um, easy just to keep things simple. And by the way, Morris Carrillo wrote a, wrote a, book, a great book on uh, life and death and the power of the tongue. But I come to James 2.8, and this is what I always think is the royal law of love when Jesus said, if you just love your neighbor as yourself, you fulfill all the other commands. So, mm -hmm. 
you know, just to, to keep things, to keep your mind sort of uncluttered by trying to remember 20 different scriptures, this to me is sort of what I, I keep at the top of my mind. You know, uh, I love that. What I do also, I do uh, Matthew 22 and 37, where he, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And it's the same thing you said, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if Jesus, they said, okay, Jesus, these 10 commandments are too much. Okay, break it down for me. Okay, I can't do all of these. What does it boil down to? <laughs> love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So then now the question becomes, who is my neighbor? Because we all love ourselves. The question is, who is my neighbor? Because if God says to love my neighbor as I love myself, I must define what is a neighbor. So that is the crux of how, and I told, I was telling someone, uh, a, a conference asked me to speak on this. I said, here's a, here's a reality. We're created as a human race, okay? And people can't see the enemy is in the midst just playing this. He's playing us. He's playing us against each other, whether it's black, white, rich, poor, and he's using every angle to divide us. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter six, our battle is not carnal. It's not flesh and blood. It's spiritual. And what happens, so is if you don't see the spiritual game the devil's playing, we're done. He's playing chess, we're playing checkers. We're fighting. <laughs> so, and until we see and unmask this, we're gonna keep losing. We keep stabbing, you know, and, and that's my frustration that people, we're fighting each other and we don't even understand this this, this another level. Right. We're, we're playing, playing twiddly wings. Yeah, we're playing peewee football. The devil's in the NFL. What are you doing? And the Bible says a house <laughs> divided cannot stand. And we as long as we're divided, we're never gonna stand. Right. So the enemy keeps on winning and he keeps on laughing at us because we think it's a black white issue. It's a Republican <laughs> independent issue. It's a Republic Democrat. That's not even an issue. <laughs> no. You know, so and it's it's amazing to me how uh, our lack of knowledge and understanding, and that's why there's a this blanket ignorance to what's really happening. It's obvious, it's right before our face, because think about it. When Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. The disciple says, why is he talking to her? Jews don't talk to Samaritans. What was that? That was a racial issue. And what did Jesus do? Jesus sat down, talked to her, and the disciples could not figure out why he's talking to her. But Jesus had no problem with it because he understood we're one race, man. <laughs> I'm trying to save everybody. But again, if you don't have a kingdom mindset, you're going to be stuck in 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 use listen our goal is to get to heaven and bring as many people as we can when we get there there's not going to be a republican side of heaven there's not going to be a democrat side of heaven okay so you you better figure it out quickly because you might put yourself in a bad spot making a decision that god is not in agreement with and that's why i try to get people to think don't think, what is, where, where, where do you find this in the Bible? What, what, what is it, where is it specifically in the Bible? Because this is our instruction book, brothers. This is it. And if I don't spend time understanding what he wants me to be, to love, to be a servant, to help, <laughs> if I don't get that, I might miss the whole boat. And that would be a loss to me, that I have spent my time more engaged in theories, ideologies, and not the book. If I'm going to stand on anything, if I'm going to, it's on the word of God. And I, I'll let, I, I'll, the because the Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain. So I have to make sure that if I'm going to stand for something, where can I find in the Bible? Where can I find the Bible? Can I, because if I'm going to stand on it, I know the word will, because remember, the Bible says God will back up his word, but he will not back up an opinion. God will back up his word. 
So I want to make sure if I'm going to stand on something, I'm standing on the word of God. Because if I'm standing on the word of God, the whole world can be against me. But if God be for me, who can be against me? Because see, when you're yeah. in the will of God, you're in the majority. I don't care if a million people are against you, but if you're in the will of God, you're in the majority. Remember, there's a brother named Samson. He took a jawbone of an ass and killed a thousand men because God was with him. And that's where we want to be. We don't want to flow against the wind. We want to flow with the wind. Let's, let's hear God in reference to our decisions, how to be a leader, and how to choose a leader. Amen, brother. Anything else, y'all? You know I like to stir the pot up, so just understand who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I run two fights. <laughs> because the Bible says, as brothers, we should reason together. The Bible says the disciples, they reason together. Also in, in uh, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, uh, we grow through vigorous debate. That's how you grow. Anything else, brothers? Thank you. I have a question. Yes, sir. So earlier, uh, the point was raised regarding uh, the ends justifying the means. Yes, sir. And uh, there's a lot of corner cutting. This is my opinion. Uh, yes, sir. And I'm mostly in business and, and in, in church as well. But anyway, a lot of corner cutting seems to be going on and uh, not a lot, not so much compliance with the rules and supposedly we live in a rule-based uh, society, but a lot of people, uh, <clears throat> the idea that we're a free society, so they choose to decide that the rules don't apply to them. So one of the points that you brought up early is that we as Christians should not uh, be causing conflict um, so my question is, uh, if we're, where we're involved in situations where there are, let's say, legal requirements, moral requirements, requirements of the Bible that are not being, not being followed, then, um, how, how do we go about addressing those issues without being a source of conflict? I think the Bible says to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. So uh, back to the initial question, does it end this fight of means? What I thought about when you said that is Galatians chapter six, it says, you shall reap what you sow. And if you sow good, you reap good. You reap bad, you reap bad. So oftentimes what we choose is a, a, a product of where we are spiritually. You reap what you sow. So, for example, like right now, God willing, I don't have to get in a legal struggle, but right now I'm, I'm, I'm in a, a, a conflict with a contractor and the church, okay? So, uh, and I called my lawyer yesterday and he says, Jomo, you're good, okay? So he says, Jomo, do you want me to call and talk to them? I said, no, I want to try to deal with this peaceably. Okay, so I'm talking man to man to see if we can work this out. The gist of it is um, we're getting a new building. Uh, they're going to pay for design work. And if, if the design work, if I go with their construction company, the design work is free. If I don't, I just pay 25K. Well, I'm going with another company. I'm fine paying 25K, but I don't have my the paperwork. I'm supposed to take the paperwork. So my lawyer said, Jomo, this is the easiest way I could deal with. I said, no, let me try to talk to them. Let me try to reason with them. Then after that, I, if I have to go legal, well, that's, that, that's a part of order. The Bible does say, try not to go to court. So as I was studying, I said, okay, Lord, you said not to go to court. 
But if I have to, if that's the end means, but I'm going to do everything in my ability to talk sense to them. If they don't hear from me, well, then I'm going to go to a higher authority. And the Bible says, biblically speaking, if you have an issue with your brother, go to your brother and try to make peace. If your brother doesn't hear you, go with two friends, try to make peace. If he doesn't hear you then, go to the spiritual leader and try to make peace. So there's three attempts to make peace before it gets escalated. So my goal was, I said, I don't really want to get lawyers involved. I want to deal with this in peace. Then once I know that I've done the best I can, now God takes over. Got it? So I do everything in my strength to make peace. After that, I give it to God. And the Bible says, do as much as you can in your own strength or as much as you can reasonably do. So that's my goal. I'm trying to make peace. And if I see that peace is not what a person wants, then I give them over to God. Because like you said, as a business person, this is what me and Chris were talking about. I said, I own the business. So I knew honor was key. I knew respect was key. I knew how I talk to people is key. I know how I treat people is key. I know that if something goes wrong, it's my fault. As a leader, I own it. Something goes wrong in children's ministry. Someone, I said, you know what? I apologize. That's my fault. They said, pastor, but you're not in children's ministry. I said, anything that's undermined, I take responsibility for. Because that's what a leader does. When things are good, you give all your people praise. When things are bad, you take ownership. I said, this is leadership 101. I said, this is not deep. I said, this is what we should do as, as, as leaders. I said, so that is what we, and that's what the challenge is. Because like you said, once you start making shortcuts, the line is gone. And once the line is gone, now it's anarchy. Just do what you want to. And you can't have a function in society where there's different rules. It's, it doesn't work. And, you know, and then all of a sudden people get pushed to different lim limits. So, you know, we're obviously we're in a dangerous time. And, you know, things should be honorable. And we should have a core that I want to do right. Should. But... Like I said, we, you, you, you reap what you sow. And if you start taking shortcuts, that shortcut's going to come back and bite you. And, you know, you, you have to be mindful of it. And so I think also, too, there's ignorance. And then once you get an understanding of what you have, then you can make a better decision, you know. But you deal with the information you have. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions, brothers? <clears throat> Praise the Lord. It's after seven o'clock. Oh, yeah. If there's nothing else, I pray. Okay. Please. Father God, I, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you that you are the all-knowing, all-seeing God. Lord, I pray that we be the leaders you called us to be. That, Father God, we walk in your steps. Lord, give us wisdom with how we live, who are, who are we to become, and the light that we're supposed to shine. Lord, I pray that we be the men of God you called us to be, the husbands, the fathers, the brothers, the uncles, the grandfathers, the business leaders. In every aspect of life, that you want us to be, let our light shine, that it may show your good works. Order our steps this day. And Father God, I thank you this day that we have an opportunity to testify of your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. But Lord, we know that without you, we are nothing. It's only by your grace that we are saved. So Lord, I thank you right now that this word, for whatever you needed to do, did what it's supposed to do. Father God, we understand that to be great leaders, we should follow you. So, Lord, I thank you right now. I give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, gentlemen. Thanks, Jamal. Jamal, and thanks for another great presentation. Thank you. Amen. You are one of our blessings. God bless you, sir. We appreciate it. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Amen. Amen. Indeed.